Good morning, church. It's good to be with you. Please turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. Probably a very familiar passage. But so much in the Bible is familiar and yet filled with depths. Ephesians 4 and verse 11, speaking of the provision our Lord has given to us, and He Himself, Jesus, has given some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Maybe a better translation, teaching pastors. There's a reason Jesus gave this for us. For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying, the building up of the body of Christ, with a goal in mind, verse 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. There's the provision. There's the purpose and there's the goal. Verse 14, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Yeah, I don't think I turned it on, sorry. Oh. Instead of that, instead of being carried away, tossed to and fro, in contrast to that, but speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in all things into Him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Jesus has provided for us that we might have all things unto life and godliness. All the knowledge of our Lord, all the knowledge that we need in order to live effective lives under the sun and successful lives, eternal lives, He has given to us so that we can grow up individually into that perfect man, Christ. Our, our pursuit in Christianity is Christ-likeness. Romans 8 and verse 29, for God determined before time began that those who would be saved are those who conform their image to that of Christ. So that is accomplished by speaking the truth in love to one another. And it's not just with regards to within the body, because the growth of the body is not just as I individually grow, as you individually grow, but as the world maybe chooses to become a part and we gain in numbers so that the body grows numerically, not just spiritually. And how is that accomplished? By speaking the truth in love. Two things I want to make special note of this morning with regards to speaking the truth in love. The first is, as we're going to note in our sermon, Speaking doesn't just have to refer to the words we say out loud to one another. Speaking can be the way we communicate with one another. One of the ways we communicate with one another is by print, right? You have a bulletin. There's a sermon outline. There are videos. There are audio files out on our website that people can click on those things and they can see and they can hear and they can learn. Sometimes we speak just with our actions, don't we? And don't we say in our society, actions speak louder than words, right? So we need to understand that when we're supposed to speak the truth in love, it doesn't necessarily just mean words, but it does mean words. And I guess the second part I want to, before we really get into it, I want to remind you of what our Lord in Matthew 7 and verse 12 did. We call it the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's just part of the verse I understand. But that's the verse I'm talking about. 
there had existed a statement before that that was very popular. And the Jewish version of that was, that which you find hateful, don't do to others. Okay? And does it sound like the same thing to you? It's similar, but the difference is world-changing. The original statement, that which you find hateful, don't do to others, is negative, and it's passive. That which is negative, don't do. So if I don't do anything, I'm fulfilling that, that adage. But what Jesus did was he took that and he turned it upside down. He made that which was negative positive. Not that which you hate, but that which you want. That which you desire. And that which was passive, he made active. I don't want you to not do bad things to other people. I want you to do good things to people. That which was negative and passive, he made active and positive. So, speaking the truth in love. What is Christianity, brethren? Is it just an intellectual pursuit? Is it just uh, how well we can study this Bible? Looks like we're going to be devoid of the, uh, the thingy. That's, that's okay. Uh, I got a really interesting message here on my screen. Um, it, it's not just an intellectual pursuit. You know, when you, when you get to heaven, the entrance exam into heaven isn't just to name all the judges in order from the book of Judges. Okay? It would be a good thing for you to know that, but that's not what it's about. Christianity isn't just about what you know. Christianity, as we talk about so often, is about who you are and who you're striving to become. Again, it's Christ-likeness, not just knowledge, ever so much more. And... We want to spread the word. How do we do that? We speak the truth in love. It just said to do that. That's how we're going to help one another inside the body of Christ, and that's how we're going to give the best opportunity to those outside the body to come to be a part and fulfill the will of God. So this morning, we're going to talk about the truth that we need to speak. Spend a little bit of time on that. And then we're going to talk about speaking the truth in love actually, how we need to realize and seize opportunities, how we need to create opportunities, and how we need to develop opportunities. To begin, this truth that we're supposed to speak in love, what is it? Well, there are, there are two overarching principles, I think, that we could put in there. The first one would be, and yes, it's, it's my harping thing, we need to understand the reality of our existence. And we need to be able to communicate that to other people. They need to understand that the life here under the sun is not about amassing wealth. It's not about having a whole bunch of interesting experiences. It is about making the decision where you will spend your eternity because you are making your decision on where you will spend your eternity, whether you realize it or not. That's the fact, okay? We need to help people understand that because it doesn't come naturally. Living here under the sun, in the flesh, in the physical world, you can begin to think easily that life is all about under the sun, in the flesh. Right? How much time do you spend trying to provide for the flesh? Working, that you might have money, that you might have food, that you might have shelter. All those things. It makes us begin to think, we can begin to think, that life is all about this physical life. The book of Ecclesiastes is such a gift from Solomon to help us understand there are good things in this physical existence and great blessings. And if you're going to do it, it might be wise to be smart. Uh, that's kind of, a, I guess, obvious to be wise to be smart. But um, that there are ways to live this life that will make it easier for you. The, the thing I love most about Ecclesiastes is how it's real. You know, it talks about wealth, okay? And what do we say? Oh, well, wealth is a bad thing because Jesus said, you know, give up all your money and, and it's harder for a rich man to get into heaven than... And, and, and yet, what did Solomon say? He said, money is a good thing. He said, you get into trouble, 
chances are money will get you out of it. <laughs> money is a good thing, but then he gives the other side of it. But at the end of the day, the rich man does the same as the poor man. He dies, stands before the judgment scene. So ultimately, money's not what it's about. We need to help people understand that this life is a choice. We're making the choice. What choice are you making? We need to do that by helping them to see our lives and our choices and talking with them about it. More about that later. The second overarching thing is we need to help them to understand the nature of God. Because when we tell them that they're here to make a decision and that that judgment is God basically taking our decision and giving us what we want. If we have shown with our life, our pursuit of Christ-likeness, that we want to be with Him forever, that's what He will give us. If we have shown Him that it's really not that important to us, our relationship with Him or our pleasing with Him or our desire to be like Him so that we can be with Him, then He won't let us be with Him. He's going to give us what He wants. That's what we want. That's the judgment. So understanding God's nature is so important. Because, brethren, there are so many caricatures out there of God and of Jesus. For some reason, even though we understand that we ourselves are complex individuals, we always try to make God this one-dimensional being, right? There are those who say God, as we talked about this morning, uh, they read the book of Judges, at least part of it, and they say, God is a homicidal maniac. Then there are people that will just read other parts of the Bible and they'll look at some of the aspects of Jesus' life and they'll say, God is nothing but love and will never damn anyone. All he wants is everybody to be happy. Well, the problem is the Bible contains both of those things. So we either have to take one and reject the other or we need to help people understand that God is complex. What does God himself say about himself? He says, I will visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands. To whom? To those who love me and keep my commandments. Okay, so God will punish and God will forgive. And he even tells us what the criteria is. Those who hate him, those who love him. The New Testament tells us that God is love. Hallelujah. The New Testament tells us God is fire, a consuming fire. Wait a minute. Which one is it? Yes. It is both of those. We need to understand and help others to understand the nature of our God. I forget where it is said. I'll, I'll pull a Paulism. Is it not written that God says again of himself, showing mercy to thousands, quick to show mercy, and yet by no means acquitting the guilty? That's his nature. We need him to help people understand that. Those two truths communicated effectively will see people to heaven, will grow the body inside and out. Let's talk about speaking this truth then. There's the truth. How do we speak it in love? effectively. Well, let's begin by talking about seizing the opportunities we have. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 9, God makes it very plain that he wants us, specifically parents, talking about the Word of God, studying the Word of God at all times, teaching it to our children, talking about it when we rise up and when we lie down, when we go out, when we come in wants it painted on the, the posts of our door. He wants our lives to be teaching opportunities. In Ephesians 5, 22, all the way through chapter 6 and verse 4, we see the importance of teaching our children and even our spouses. Because we're supposed to love our wives, husbands, as Christ loved the church. Surely that, about presenting her spotless and blameless before the Lord, entails a little discussion about faith, the reality of existence, the nature of our God. Parents and grandparents, if you know your Deuteronomy, extends it on. 
I found myself in my first work spending far more time trying to engage in a Bible study with people who had no desire to study than I did with my own children and my own wife who were there, willing to study, and a captive audience <laughs> to a degree. Yes? Don't fall into that trap. God has given these children into your hands. Take advantage of that opportunity. Speak to them the truth in love. What did Jesus say with regards to those who were with him? He said to the apostles that he was going to make them fishers of men. And then what did he do? Then he spent three years doing it. Edwin Jones used to say, I wonder what kind of preaching school Jesus would have come up with. And then he would smile and say, we don't have to wonder. He did it. Because you notice that when Jesus took these men and said he was going to train them up to be fishers of men, he didn't have them come into an office five days a week, eight hours a day. What did Jesus do? He lived with them 24-7 for three years. That's how he did it, speaking the truth in love. Well, again, we have our children. Those of you who have been so blessed, you have grandchildren. You have time. You have the breath of life. Train up your children. We need to be not raising engineers. Nothing wrong with raising up engineers. We need to be raising up soldiers of Christ. We need to be raising up people who are stronger and more founded in the faith than we are that they can take the word forward and it can snowball to the glory of our God. Not just give them a little Jesus as I'm pushing them into the secular world. Because then we find out later in life, there they're in the secular world, Jesus has been left behind, oh my, I wonder how that happened. This is serious. As we talked this morning, life is serious. Give what is the most important, the most importance. Spend the time, seize that opportunity, and train up your children. Husbands and wives, train up one another, strengthen one another, challenge one another to grow in the faith unto everlasting life. Isn't that what marriage is about? We know in heaven there is no marriage, so its purpose is here. What's the purpose here? The purpose here is that when I get there, Lord willing, one day, and I look over and there's my beautiful wife in paradise, I can know I was a part of that, that crown, that joy that Paul still spoke about. Take advantage of the opportunities we have. And it's not just with our family, our co-workers. Do they know you're Christian? Yeah, they know I'm Christian. Do they know you are New Testament Christians only? Do they know that? Have you had them over your house? Does your house speak the truth in love? Could I go into your house right now and know that you're Christians? By what's on the walls. By what's on the stands, underneath the television. Would I know? Does it declare to all? Now, I'm not saying you've got to have like Christmas lights with a cross on your, <laughs> the front of your house. I'm not saying that. You understand what I'm saying. Do they know from the way you carry yourself and the way you speak that you're a Christian. I would recommend you think about this. The world is filled with idioms. M. Idioms. Right? Stitch in time saves nine. Thank you, Benjamin. How about we strive to use Christian idioms and say, well, it's like Paul said. Boom. Well, it's kind of like the, the example of Balaam, right? Trying to do something so foolish that even a donkey knows better. Using biblical idioms stimulates possibly biblical discussion. If anything, it puts a, a, a billboard above your head that says, if you're interested in the Bible stuff, talk to me. See me. 
take advantage of the opportunities you have. God has given them to us. We're supposed to shine as light, be the salt of the earth. We're supposed to have people looking at our lives, noticing the difference, 1 Peter 3.15, so that they would actually come to us and say, why are you different? I've noticed something about you. What's, what is it? Why don't you engage? I notice you don't engage in the profanity. I notice that when, when we're, we're, we're in the shop and we're tearing apart the shop steward, I notice you tend to just kind of walk away. You're not a part of that. What's, what's your deal? Invitation to speak the truth in love. Take advantage of the opportunities you have. Secondly, speaking the truth in love, we have to create opportunities. Because I don't, I don't have that many people uh, in my life that I have that kind of leverage and influence like I do with my family and friends and I was going to say co-workers, but I'm kind of here alone in the building, but me, myself, and I, for sure. Uh, the people that do my hair, well, I mean, that's Bob, so I'm, you get my point. So I need to find ways that I can create opportunity. And how do we do that? T turn in your Bibles, brethren, to Ephesians 5 and verse 11, because I don't think you're going to like the ways that the Lord often suggested and showed. The Apostle Paul is saying that Christians ought not to engage in the wicked works of darkness like the world around us. Look at verse 11. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Verse 13, he makes the point that because we're light, we automatically, by nature, expose the works of darkness. What does that mean? How do we create opportunities to speak the truth in love by exposing darkness? Think about what our Lord did. How many times did our Lord come upon a situation that was not right and deal with it? Picture our Lord at least twice in the temple of God. And what did the Son of God do? The anointed one of God when he came to the temple. He starts flipping tables, pushing people around, making whips, and chasing animals out of them. What is that about? He saw God being blasphemed. And he said, I'll have none of it. How many times did he address the hard-heartedness of the Pharisees? Why do you think they put him to death? Why couldn't he just shut his mouth and realize, you know, you got to go along to get along? Because that's not the purpose of life, church. Our life purpose is, are you ready? To die and go to heaven. That's your purpose. It's not to stay here because guess what? The world is passing away and the lust of it. Our purpose here is to make the decision that I want to spend eternity with God. I want to die in the faith that I might receive that reward. So we need to be like Jesus and speak up. It's difficult. You're going to be called names. You're going to be unfriended on Facebook. <gasps> A fellow preacher I know on Facebook mentioned that he's had videos taken down from YouTube when he spoke about LGBTQ plus minus divided by three. He spoke about it. He wasn't mean-spirited. He simply said, God said it's sin. Can't enact in that. No one like that is ever going to receive or enter the kingdom of heaven. They took his video down. Okay? Good on him for speaking up. We've got to speak up. Because you know what silence seems like? Seems like we're complicit with it. That we're okay with it. We've got to speak up. I was watching a Marvel movie uh, the other day. And there's this flash of a scene where a character looks and, and she sees two women. And she says, oh, those are my parents. And I had to hit pause and say, no, it isn't. That's not how it works. One of those might be one of your parents, but the other one is their homosexual partner. Somewhere is your father. And that's what parents are, because that's how words work. 
But what are we going to do with that in our culture? We have to speak up. Can a woman be a man by having plastic surgery? No. That's a man, or excuse me, a woman that maybe looks more like a man. But it's not a man. We've got to speak up about that. Are we just going to allow it to happen? Oh, this individual now is pretending to be a man, so I've got to say he is a man? Why? That's not true. That's not reality. Brethren, again, not to be mean with this, but not too long ago, this was a mental illness that was treated. If I suddenly think I'm Napoleon Bonaparte, are you going to give me a French army to invade Russia? No, because there obviously must be something wrong with me because I am not Napoleon Bonaparte. Just like there must be something wrong horribly. And I feel so sorry for this people. For a woman to feel like she's really a man, that must feel terrible. But no matter what happens, she's a woman. God doesn't make mistakes. She is what she is, and that's all that she is. We need to help her instead of dealing with this false reality and just letting it happen. Brethren, those of you who have had children or even been around children, if you allow a child to act poorly, badly, and you don't say anything about it, what's going to happen? It's going to continue. I forget that statement that uh, Brother Ote said, and he may not have been the one. Behavior you reward will be repeated. Behavior you reward will be repeated. So if someone acts in a sinful way and the whole world goes like this and we don't stand up and say anything, that behavior will simply be repeated and it will become the norm. We must speak. How? I'm going to talk about that in a little bit later. But we have to speak because we had that wonderful thing that happened recently where Roe v. Wade was overturned. But brethren, I pray that you understand. Abortion will not cease in America because of some judges. Abortion won't cease because of some election. Abortion will cease when people want to stop killing their babies. And that means speaking the truth in love and winning the hearts and minds of our neighbors, of our country. It requires action, speaking, addressing those issues. Third one, we must develop opportunities. Sometimes, got to stop talking. Matthew 7 and 6, Jesus said, don't give, you know, don't give uh, pearls to swine. Uh, don't give what is holy to the dogs. Jesus didn't have a lot of interaction with the Sadducees. They, they didn't even believe in life after death. I, I don't think he realized or thought they had much to talk about. There can be people that we try to talk about who say, or talk to who simply say, shut up, I don't want to hear any of your Jesus stuff. Okay. Speaking is probably not going to be effective with my words, but that doesn't mean I'm done speaking. There's still the way I live and conduct myself that can influence them. Here's the horrible reality, brethren. We could do a thousand things in their sight correctly. And if we are hypocritical one time, we've lost all that. Just as children are so good at seeing hypocrisy, so too adults. If we don't walk the walk consistently, well, Rick, I can't help, I can't be perfect. What happens when I'm not perfect? My advice would be to go very public and loud with your repentance so that they understand, yeah, I violated my principles and you're aware of it, but this is not okay. But God, in His grace, has allowed me to be able to repent, to rue what I've done, to pray for my forgiveness and to wash it away that I may walk better another day, so that they can see that, not just try to ignore it. We have to develop opportunities with our lives, and it means going out there. It means thinking about how to interact with somebody. We all know somebody that's on the periphery of our lives that we've said to our spouse or to a friend, 
Boy, they're such a nice person. I really like them. Okay, then start scheming. How do we get them to Jesus? How do we start influencing them to Jesus? Let's talk about it. Let's get together brethren and talk about it. What can we do? Do you know him? You know him? Hey, maybe you could, whatever it takes, by hook, by crook, speaking the truth in love. And that's the, that's the last point, brethren. Turn to 1 Peter, please, chapter 3. I used to call it the preacher's verse because I love 315, but we're going to read 314 through 16. But even if you should suffer, Christians, for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God, or Christ, in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Brethren, with meekness and fear. With meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. Brethren, the way we say things is sometimes more important than what we say. Same with our actions. The way we do it can be just as important, you know. Hey, Olivia, I told you to shut your bedroom door. So she stomps over to it and slams it off its hinges. There, she did what I asked, right? There's going to be a discussion. She doesn't do that, hasn't done that. And with those doors, it would break the whole house. Those are serious doors. Our manner, brethren. When we speak to someone who's engaged in sin, pursuing it headlong, we have to be meek and fearful. And what I mean fearful is with our God, reverential. And when they abuse us, when we're trying to talk to them to the truth, we can't rise to the bait. We can't get angry also. We have to be wise and just constantly refer them to God with that spirit. Unfortunately, we don't have time to continue with this, but we will continue with this because inside the church, maybe we, we get a little warmer. Therefore, carpe diem indeed, brethren. Seize the day. Ephesians 5 and verse 16. Redeem the day, Christians, being wise, not as fools. Redeem the time. Here we are. God has given us life. We have time. Use it to glorify Him. Speaking the truth in love to one another, to the whole world, with words, with every aspect of our lives. To God be the glory. If you're not a Christian this morning, God calls to you because He loves you so much. And His desire is that you allow him to wash your sin away. That he might be reconciled to you and that you might be able to be with him forever on that day that is surely coming. If you've never taken him up on his grace, why not this morning? Christians, we're in the world. We're not of the world. You may have heard this illustration. It's okay for a boat to be in the water, but it's not okay for water to be in the boat. That's how it's supposed to be with us Christians. We can't let that world get too much into us because then we'll become non-distinct. They won't see us as different. They won't see us as anything else but the world. And then we can't influence them for our Lord. Strive to be holy as He is holy. Strive to serve His will, reaching all men. That's His will. If you haven't been doing that, turn back. If there's anything we can